Good afternoon, and welcome to Adith Israel Congregation's online presentation. My name is Lauren Applebaum, and I work with Forest Hill Real Estate Brokerage in Toronto, and I've been a lifelong member of Adith Israel. We recognize that these are challenging times that our community is experiencing. We hope that you are all well and safe, and we're pleased that you're sharing this afternoon with us. Today, we're introducing a new series of programs based on the theme, How I Built This. To lead off this series, it's our pleasure to feature Erwin Simon, a serial entrepreneur. Erwin was born and raised in Glace Bay, Nova Scotia, and we're delighted to welcome many of Erwin's friends and relatives from the Maritimes and across Canada. I would like to give a special shout out to Naomi Rosenfeld, who is the Executive Director of the Atlantic Jewish Council. Naomi is well known at Adif as she had her bat mitzvah and was married at Adif Israel. As well, we are appreciative that the AJC is a promotional sponsor of Adith programming. JNF Future is also a promotional sponsor and we certainly thank them for their support. Speaking of Maritimers, I'm pleased to welcome Eric Goldberg, today's moderator. Eric is a management consultant at McKinsey and Company where he focuses on helping companies solve complex strategic problems. Prior to joining McKinsey, Eric was a corporate lawyer at Goodman's LLC. Hailing from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Eric started his career as a legal and finance intern for Erwin Simon, today's guest speaker at his firm, Kane Celestial. Please welcome Eric Goldberg. Thank you, Lauren. It is my pleasure to introduce Erwin Simon. Born and raised in Glace Bay, Nova Scotia, Erwin founded the Haynes Celestial Group in 1993, which he built into a leading global organic and natural products company and served as its president and CEO and chairman through 2018. He is currently the CEO of Afria, an international producer and distributor of medicinal and recreational cannabis. Among a slew of recent transactions, Afria recently announced a reverse merger with Tilray that will make it the largest revenue cannabis company in the world. Erwin was named CEO of that merged company. Erwin also serves on the board of directors of Tulane University and is the majority owner of the K Breton Screaming Eagles, a Quebec major junior hockey league team and co-owner of the St. John's Edge of the National Basketball League of Canada. Once again, on behalf of everyone joining virtually today from Toronto and abroad, including from the Maritimes, Thank you so much for being here with us today, Erwin. Thank you, Eric, and good afternoon, everybody. And uh, um, it's great to uh, be here talking to lots of friends and family. Um, it, it, it is great that uh, I can reconnect this way. In this pandemic that we're living in today, um, you know, I'd love to give everybody a hug, love to be out there to shake hands. Um, love to visit Canada, which can't even do and must got to go stay in a hotel. And, you know, if I get tested and test positive, then you're locked up for two weeks. Anyway, um, when, when Joey asked me to do this, I said, Joey, like, uh, I, I enjoy talking. I enjoy speaking. Um, and, and what I want to make sure is this here, this is not about Erwin Simon and his life is, you know, the world has changed dramatically and change is going to happen and uh you know what has changed in your life what continuously changes in my life um you know adith israel um, one of the largest oldest synagogues and conservative synagogue um a multi-generation synagogue and thank you very much for hosting me today and doing this um it was because of the big check that joey wrote me that's why i decided to do it no just kidding anyway um you know, I'm going to take you through 20, 25 minutes of, of my life and growing up in Glace Bay. And I always say this here. I'm sitting here today in New York City where we're supposed to get 12 inches of snow very shortly. In Glace Bay, 12 inches of snow was a normal day. Um, there's times when I have to go to the upstairs in my, you know, three bedrooms and one bathroom house, which was great, compact and warm to get out because we had so much snow. You know, growing up in Glace Bay, um, and I'm not sure a lot of you have been there. A lot of you have been to Cape Breton, one of the most beautiful places, I say, in Canada, if not in the world. And uh, I always say I wish my kids had my upbringing. I wish, you know, I had their upbringing. Um, and, 
you know, talking about synagogues, Glace-based synagogue, going to synagogue was very important to me, going to Hebrew school five days a week, being bar mitzvahed in Glace Bay, where I learned Friday night service, uh, Saturday morning, laying from the Torah, doing Musa, which I can still do today, and, you know, had a great bar mitzvah reception later for probably $1,200. And that is not what happens in bar mitzvahs today. When you do your haftori, you've done a great job and you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on you know, um, the events and the party afterwards. And, uh, um, you know, always it was important to go to synagogue on a Saturday or a Friday night to get a minion. And you've kind of built your life around getting a minion in Glace Bay and uh, uh, grew up in a kosher home. Um, Imagine my father was a kosher butcher in town with 35 Jewish families. You could, you know, believe how busy he was. The other important thing I'll never, ever forget is Camp Kadima. I went to Camp Kadima for 14 years uh, between staff and a camper. And again, going to Camp Kadima this summer um, connected me with Judaism, connect me, you know, with uh, other Jewish people around the world. And i got to tell you, um, some of the greatest learning, some of the greatest friends, um, and some of you are on this call today or some of you on the Zoom, and I, and I can't go back and talk enough about Camp Kadima, how great it was for me. Um, I didn't send my kids there, um, and probably one of the mistakes I've made, but uh, um, again, going to men's camp afterwards, and just so many fond, fond memories of going to Camp Kadima. Um, and, and, you know, you think you think back today, even the connections and that and Camp Kadima, not last year, but what a, and how it was a thriving camp to bring so many uh, Jewish people around the world together. Um, you know, growing up um, after going to regular school, Central, Morrison, um, I was one of the ones that went on to St. Mary's University and uh, I didn't go to Dalhousie. Um, but uh, I went to SMU and, uh, you know, school for me, I, I was not your best student. Um, I didn't graduate in honors. I was lucky. And there's times I show people my transcript. And, uh, you know, I sit on the board today of a school called Tulane University, which is a great school. My kids always said to me, Dad, how do you sit on the board of a university? Look at your look at your transcripts. It's not what my transcript was. It's what I did, what I learned. And I was very involved in school and in student council, uh, board of governors, um, very involved. You know, I ran for president. But, I, you know, school for me, maybe I didn't get my MBA or didn't get my law degree, but I got my MBWA, management by walking around, management by learning. And, you know, I had to work. Um, I had to pay my way through school. I had nobody paying my way. I took out student loans and, uh, you know, learned a lot. Um, you know, after school, I couldn't get into law school, couldn't get into MBA school, so had to go on to do something else. Um, Andrew Wolfson gave me an opportunity to learn how to drive cars, uh, sell cars, and uh, learn about the car business. And I know how to buy cars today and uh, um, love the car business. And uh, it was something uh, very interesting learning the car business. You know, I learned how to bartend along the way. Um, and, you know, growing up in a family of five um, and, you know, always, you know, my mother who passed away last year, my father who passed away in 1989, um, you know, I three older sibling, siblings, my sisters and my younger brother, um, you know, we all knew what we had to do to contribute. We all knew what we had to do to work at Simon's Dairy. We all knew what I had to do to deliver the Passover orders of the kosher meat. And it's just we went out and did it. Um, you know, my father, you know, if I don't go to a sports event with my kids, you know, like that, where are you? Um, and I don't think my father ever saw me play hockey or, you know, saw me play in a baseball game, et cetera, as he was working. But uh, I always knew they were there for me. I always knew my, you know, my mother was there for me. Um, you know, I, I, I hear my wife all the time with my kids, homework, homework, homework. You know, I used to put my books on the radiator when I came in and I used to pick them up the next day and homework was not, you know, in, important to me. So different times growing up, different times of learning. And today it's absolutely different times, you know, of learning virtually. 
Um, a- after SMU, I went on to do numerous things and I went to, you know, sell life insurance and I learned pretty quickly, not for me, you got to die to win. And that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, again, what I, what I say is this here, you got to make your own luck happen. You got to make something happen. And, uh, I was able, got a lucky break in 1983 in moving to Toronto. And I went to work for haagen ice cream, which was Nielsen's and, uh, um, and actually, that was 1981. And uh, I loved living in Toronto. But in 1983, I had an opportunity to move to New York. And I'd probably been to New York once before and didn't know what it was like. And I think a lot of times it's every Canadian's dream to move to New York and have a job and try and get your L1 or your green card, etc. Moved here in 1983, worked for haagen for eight years and, um, you know, it was acquired by a, a multinational company. And with that, I moved up through the ranks and had multiple um, jobs with them. But I knew along the way I was an entrepreneur. I was not a corporate guy. I, I, I couldn't play the part. I couldn't, you know, kiss people's, you know, where they wanted me to kiss them. I couldn't do the things they wanted me to do. I knew I was not going to live in the corporate world. So in 1991, and I come back and say this here, everybody in their life should take a flyer. I went to work for a guy named Danny Abraham, who owned SlimFast. And, uh, you know, SlimFast was a company that went from, you know, basically uh, zero to a billion dollar plus company and was run like a convenience store. And uh, I went there and uh, at, at the time I, I learned a lot about how not to run a business and I learned, you know, ultimately, if this was my company, what would I do differently and how could I do something differently? Um, I got fired from there. One of the best things that ever happened to me, one of the toughest things that ever happened to me. Um, in 1992, I got fired. I was about to get married. My wife said to me, why am I marrying you? You got no job. You got no green card. You basically got no money. So why am I marrying you? And, you know, with that, I, I'll never forget. I, you know, at that time. I was in the midst of, as I got married, uh, applying for a green card. Um, I started to go out and look for a job in the U.S. And uh, I didn't go to, you know, Harvard. I didn't go to Yale. I didn't go to Duke. I didn't go to Tulane. So that was a problem. I didn't really have the right papers to work. I was in the midst of getting them. Um, I really didn't, you know, I had a marketing and sales background. So what I said is I'm going to go start my own business in healthy foods. And I learned a lot at haagen about brand, brand equity, building brands. Um, and I learned a lot at SlimFast about how everybody wanted to lose weight and the change, you know, in regards to where food was coming from and what food was. And everybody was on these SlimFast diets, but no one ever kept the weight off. And very quickly, you know, ultimately they became fad diets. But I knew that food was going to change dramatically to natural, organic, GMO freeze, um, all the ingredients. So in 1993, with $200,000 of my money, um, I went out and started a company. I went out and tried to borrow money. Banks wouldn't, you know, give me money. I went out and tried to raise money and I couldn't raise money. I went out and found a small underwriter to take me public. And I never knew anything about running a public company. And, you know, with that, I was able to take, um, at that time, it was called Canarid Acquisition Corp. And very lucky, it was a kosher food company built around natural foods. Um, we were a $2 million company. I went public in 1983 at a market cap of $3 million. And, you know, at its height, Haines Celestial became a $7 billion market cap company. Um, when I closed on my offering, I had um, $250,000 left in the bank, and I knew that was not going to last long, and I'd have to do something differently. Uh, and again, you know, took chances, surrounded myself with smart people, and very quickly um, I went out and was able to buy other companies. And and one of the big things, you know, in regards to Hain, um, I surrounded myself by good people. Some of the best decisions in life were people. Some of my worst decisions in life were people. So when I'm, you know, 1993, um, you know, in, in 2000, went on to buy Celestial Seasonings. When I bought Hain in 1994, I changed the name of the company. Um, and when I bought Celestial Seasons, went on to become, you know, Hain Celestial. 
Hain was built into a three and a half billion dollar market cap company, a three and a half billion dollars in sales, you know, sold in 65 countries, had 12,000 people um, at its height, had seven billion dollars of market cap, um, you know, made lots of mistakes along the way. And I learned every day, um, you know, along the way I had activists like Carl Icahn that I had to go up against. You know, I raised billions of dollars in money for acquisitions, integrated acquisitions, you know, had regulatory, whether, you know, the SEC, um, whether it was the UK, went into India and bought a company in India dealing with Indian regulations, the Middle East, um, Israel, Israel, et cetera. And a lot of it was, you know, again, learning along the way um and getting the right information and it was always about you know taking some risks and taking you know what were the rewards for it um and you know the key i say it always some of the best decisions i made were people some of the dumbest decisions i've made were people and you just never ever ever know um you know a lot along the way i you know sat on other boards and you know um i started to look at other things and then as 2017, I felt, you know what, it's time, maybe I'm going to do something, I want to do something different. Um, and I, I think the best thing that ever happened to me of Hain, the second best thing ever happened to me when I realized it was time for me to leave Hain and go do something different. Um, I went to my board in 2017 and told them I wanted to leave. And, you know, I had to make a decision when you leave, you got to leave and you can't kind of partially leave. And along the way, um, I originally was going to stay on as chairman. Um, and I decided, you know, in late 2018, if I was going to leave, you got to leave. And I had to give up, you know, some equity, which was worth it and had to, uh, you know, really walk away. And with that, you know, basically a lot of the people I had brought in, the acquisitions I did, you know, along the way, the relationships I had, you know, when you said Hain, you said Irwin, but I decided I'm walking away and it was a big decision and people would come to me, how do you just walk away? Well, you just walk away. And, and I was able to do that. Um, so in December, 2018, I walked away and, uh, you know, with that, what was I going to do? And I think when people have changes in their career, changes in their life, and Hain was my life before my four kids, Hain was my life when my wife started to work there. You know, I had a connection to so many people, um, connection all around the world. And this was something that, you know, was my fifth child. But you know, the good news is I'm easily adaptable. I was able to separate myself. Um, how was I going to stay busy? Um, I was on the board of Barnes and Noble. I was a, on the board of MDC Partners, and I had planned to do a SPAC. And I went out to do, you know, started on a SPAC before, you know, people knew what SPACs were. And now SPACs are one of the hottest things out there. As as Eric said, I had my hockey team in Cape Breton, the Cape Breton Eagles. Um, which, you know, again, it's like, I guess, only the Toronto Maple Leafs in Toronto are not the same values. Um, and I also, with my partner, Rob Sabah, own a basketball team in St. John's, Newfoundland. And uh, many times people ask me, what the hell do you own a basketball team in St. John's, Newfoundland? And I had not been to St. John's, Newfoundland prior to owning the basketball team there. And it's been a great experience. And St. John's has been a, it's been a fun experience. Um so with that, um, my plan was to do my SPAC. I got an early call in December of 2018 um, from somebody that was on the board of Afria. And Afria was a leading cannabis company. And I, I really believe cannabis was the next natural organic foods and the next big opportunity out there. And I'm a visionary. I look always for what's the next big thing out there. Uh, I'm in stores all the time. You know, at Hain, meat free was Eve's non dairy. You, you know, was our non dairy business with Rice Dream, Almond Dream, um, kabuchas. We were the first personal care products. Um, I'm always out there. What is the next big thing? You know, chlorine free diapers. You know, we owned uh, 
you know, in, in reg regards to wipes and regards to hand sanitizers and stuff like that. I was always out. So again, with my SPAC, I was going to look for what's the next big thing with the SPAC and what was, you know, the opportunity there. So when I got the call from a free, I was looking at the cannabis um, business. I had an investment in another cannabis business in the U.S., which I looked to do something. And Afria was going through some challenges. Um, they had a short report that came out that a hostile takeover um, and accused the CEO and, you know, the C-suite of doing some things. Um, they begged me to be chairman. I kept saying, no, no, no. But I decided to take on a challenge and I joined the board December 28th, 2018. The same day I joined the board, they got a hostile takeover um, from somebody from the U.S. And that was quickly what I had to deal with. At the same time, when I got in there, I quickly realized we had about $20 million of cash left and we we're burning about $20 million a month. So it was not pretty. Um, and went in there and we cut, and burned, um, sold some assets, um, was able to negotiate and get rid of the hostile takeover had to fire the CEO and the founders. And when I looked around and said, who's gonna become the CEO, um, it was myself. And I, I said, when I left Hain, I was never gonna be a CEO of a public company again. Um, today I'm you know, CEO of Afria and, and chairman, and I'm an executive chairman of my company called Hold Earth. So never say never, because you never know what's gonna be. So. Uh, um, and then sit on the board and lead director of another public company. So with that, April 1st came and I became the CEO. Uh, my first earning call, I, I, I released, we lost $100 million because of write downs, et cetera. Um, the next day I went out and raised 350 million US in a convert um, to fund the company, which basically then took us out of the woods. Um, the next earnings call, a free of broke even or made a little bit of money. And ever since then, um, you know, the last eight quarters, um, we are EBITDA positive and the company today is really performing extremely well on all cylinders. Um, we're the number one cannabis company in Canada today. Um, we're the number one cannabis company in Europe in regards to medical. And I think there's so much opportunity in regards to the medical cannabis world. Um, and you know, once we got a free, it totally cleaned up. It was like, what's the next thing? And there's lots of, lots of, you know, laws around a free, uh, the cannabis business and health Canada, uh, regards to legalization. I cannot do any business in the U S in the cannabis world. I can't own anything because cannabis is not legal federally. You know, when I did my convert, um, you know, I had $350 million of cash and I couldn't put it in any bank in the U.S. because they wouldn't take it because, you know, we are a cannabis company and cannabis is not legal federally. Um, with that, we went on to announce just recently um, we bought a brewery business, Sweetwater Brewery, um, which is a $60 million plus brewery in Atlanta that has a connection to cannabis. There's no THC, there's no CBD in any of their drinks, but I think CBD and THC will be a big part of their drinks. And uh, so today we sell, you know, cannabis, alcohol, and, uh, you know, cannabis for medical, cannabis for recreational. And I see just a big, big future in that. And Tilray was a company that had at one time a $30 billion market cap. The stock was at $300 a share. Um, and I think they lost their way and it's going to be exciting to put these two companies together. We're doing a reverse merger, which means we're going to re-domicile in the U S will be a U.S. based company. Um, we'll still trade on NASDAQ and the Toronto stock exchange. And, you know, for the next year or two, I will run this as the CEO and chairman and bringing these two companies together. We're in the midst of that. We go for shareholder approval sometime in April and hopefully to have that deal done, you know, sometime in March. Um, along the way, um, I talked about my SPAC. I raised $350 million in my SPAC. And a SPAC is a special acquisition check that basically is a public company. It allows you to go out and buy a private company and you back it into that. And I did my SPAC in April of 2019. And uh, I did find a company in 2019. It was a company we acquired from Ron Perlman. 
and we announced the deal in December of 2019. We closed on the deal in June of 2020. Um, and since then, we've gone on to do two more deals. So today, um, my SPAC became Whole Earth Brands, which trades as free. And the strategy there is owning companies that are free from, whether it's free from sugar, um, free from dairy, free from meat. Um, it's about a half a billion dollar company today with $100 million EBITDA. And there I'm executive chairman and we're just in the midst of completing you know, an acquisition there in regards to um, organic sugars and uh, all organic products. And the name of that SPAC was Act Two. And that was, you know, basically the next heme um, that will be out there building, you know, along the way. Um, and, and again, you know, it, it's it's juggling. It's, it's um, you know, Freya is where I'm, I'm running the day-to-day -day operations. Whole Earth is where, you know, I'm working with the teams and they're running, you know, again, ultimately, uh, the business and I'm helping them with acquisitions, raising money and, and dealing, you know, from a, from a market standpoint. Um, you know, COVID has been really different. Uh, I, again, I, I was not your most computer literate guy. I didn't know how to use Zoom probably in January of 2020. Um, I didn't know how to use Teams. Um, with that, you either learn to become, you know, from a technical standpoint, sitting next to me today is Lloyd Brathwaite, who runs all our ITs around the world just to make sure everything, you know, has gone well. Um, but COVID has been interesting. Um, for myself in 2020, I did eight deals um, between Afria, between Whole Earth and personal deals. And, uh, you know, with that, uh, I've learned a lot and learned how to juggle a lot. Um, as I said before, I have four, four kids, which are a big part of my life. My wife, you know, which um, was there with me from the beginning here. And how are you able to do it? And, uh, you know, I got a lot done during COVID um, in between raising money for Afria, raising money for Whole Earth, um, doing some other personal things, de um, and, you know, doing the Sweetwater deal and, announcing the Tilray deal. So uh, getting that done, um, you know, with that, uh, I was able to get it done. And, uh, and, and I got to tell you, I couldn't be happier. I couldn't be having more fun. I couldn't be learning, you know, as much as I have. And I get asked all the time about Hain and some was like, that was when, you know, whatever. And uh, um, so, you know, with that COVID, if you could get back and if I was sitting here last year this time and I thought we'd be in the same place that we are with COVID um, and, and how do you pull your teams together? Um, you know, I, I was coming to Toronto a bit, can't come there anymore. Here I am running a company from the U.S. Um, you know, we got operations in Toronto, Leamington, Vancouver, um, Germany, Italy, um, Atlanta now. And how do you do a major merger and an acquisition where you can't go out and visit? You can't go out there and shake hands, look at people straight in the eye. Um, it's hard to do it, but no different than I'm doing over Zoom today. Um, we've done all our earnings calls over Zooms. We've met with multiple investors. So you have to adapt and you have to feel that you're getting, you know, the right, uh, the, the right intelligence and you got to have the right people with it. Um, and, and I think, Listen, COVID's going to be around for a long time. We're going to be in this situation. It's amazing, you know, when I'm in New York here and I drive down certain streets and just see emptiness and don't see people. Um, and, you know, I've also had to do some things in regards to the reorganization, terminate people, keep facilities going. How do you keep facilities going and manage through COVID? Um, you know, we've had a lot of COVID spread through our facilities and our greenhouses um, and, you know, keeping people safe and investing a lot of money in that. Um, at the same time, you know, being on the board of university, I had a long call with Tulane and keeping kids safe. My both kids went back to university and one is in New Orleans, one is in California. Um, my other son, which I'm on the board with Brooklyn Poly Prep, 
Um, they learned outside for the longest time and how did you keep them safe? And I've always learned a lot from being involved with schools of how you take that back, you know, from your business standpoint. Um, so with that, you know, it's been a great ride. Um, personally, you know, how do you deal with all this? And you take your long walks in the morning um, with my dog in the park. You think about your things. You have your priorities. You have, you know, basically a good team around you and you communicate. Um, it's, it's really important how you treat people, how you're perceived. I, I always say this before, arrogance it does not go along in business today. Um, you got to have a plan. And, you know, you heard Eric talk about you know, before um, with him being with, you know, McKinsey, we used his competitor, BCG and consultants to help where you got to go out there and have great professionals to help you with this here. Listen, we see what's happening last week with GameStop in the world. And I've had the short reports come at me. You know, I've had activists come at me. Um, I've had multiple, you know, whether SEC investigations on stuff, class action lawsuits and how do you deal with it? You can't let it get to you personally. Um, and I look at it every day, you know, what hap what's going to happen out there? Is a two by four going to hit you in the head? Um, and how hard is it and how do you deal with it? After 30 years of experience, I feel I've seen everything. But, you know, what, what comes first is your family. And, you know, I got to tell you, um, I, I think growing up where I grew up has been very, very, you know, important to me, um, coming from the roots where people are important to me, um, being, you, you know, I still put, I'll never forget 1996 when a Chabad rabbi came to me and convinced me to put on tefillin and he said it would change my life. I still put tefillin on every day. Um, of course, except Saturday, um, when I could, you know, I was going to synagogue every day when my mother passed away to say Kaddish. You got to have spirituality in your life. And that's really important that that happens and you connect to something. Um, you know, the question asked to me all the time, you know, who's your mentor? Who do you look up to? Um, you know, I, I, I look up to a lot of people and I get advice and talk to a lot of people. And at the end of the day, when you, you know, it, they always say it's lonely at the top because it becomes your problem. Um, I'm big in my organization where we all own it. And uh, we live we live by numbers, we die by numbers. And, and again, we communicate. You know, this past week I deal, dealt with a situation in Europe that I had to deal with, couldn't go there, had to get, you know, lawyers, security involved. And we dealt with it as a team and, and, and that's what it, that's how you deal with it. So um, with that, I will come back to you for questions. I want to thank Joey, uh, Philip um, and my team for organizing this. Um, you know, I always want to thank my family because at the end of the day, they're always there. Um, you know, during COVID, listen, since last March, um, we've been together as a family in, in Long Island. Um, and the city, and we've had three meals together, and we have never been closer. So, yes, we've been safe from COVID, and none of us, thank God, I'll knock on wood, got it. But, you know, we've it built a lot of family time. We had a lot of Netflix time. And, you know, with that, we, we hung a lot and had to get through it. And uh, it makes you a stronger family. Um, and uh, I'm glad so many other people have dealt with it. Um, when you see what's gone on in Toronto. It's just how it is closed down. You read about, you know, what's happening there. It's just difficult to comprehend that this could happen in the world. But I think we're on the back end of it. And hopefully this summer, uh, I can get up to Camp Kadima. I can get up to Sydney and see some of my investments there, see the people there. And hopefully one of these days soon, I can get to see everybody else. So um, with that, Eric, I'll turn it back to you um, and I'll let you ask me questions um, that I can answer. I want to, you know, uh, a special mention to my siblings that are probably listening. Um, my Aunt Tootsie, who is in her 90s, who is in Sydney, Nova Scotia, who is listening. 
Um, Tootsie, hopefully I'll get to see you soon. I know the Eagles lost their first two games, but uh, we'll be back soon. We're just getting back here. You know, even dealing with this Dr. Strain to try and get, you know, fans in the stands in Nova Scotia has been an interesting learning experience. And I can understand why this Dr. Fauci has been difficult. But, uh, um, you know, politically, the premier is leaving Nova Scotia and dealing with him because he wants his legacy. You know, so in business, how do you connect business and politics? And uh, Newfoundland has totally shut everything down. But uh, we're good news is we're back playing hockey. We're back playing the Halifax Mooseheads um, this afternoon. And, uh, but we got no fans and you know, when you got no fans, you're not making any money and you're just writing checks. So anyway, um, Eric, I'll turn it over to you. I, I, I was told I only could talk for 20, 25 minutes. So I'll come to you for the questions. That, no, that's great. And thank you so much for that, Aaron. That was, that was very inspirational and, uh, and a really interesting overview. Um, I think there's one question that may be on everyone's mind that I won't ask you because I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think there may be a question of whether cannabis is kosher, but maybe we'll leave that uh, to the rabbis. Um, so, I'm getting so, so that's a good question because that is something that I, um, you know, listen, we have, and, and anybody, you know, after COVID um, wants to come down, we have over two and a half million square feet of growing in Leamington, Ontario, 265,000 kilos. And, and again, did I ever think in a lifetime I'd be selling cannabis? And, and again, I refer to it as cannabis, not marijuana anymore. I refer to it as pre-rolls, not a joint, you know, vapes, flowers, um, cannabis. And I, and I commend Canada for being the first in recreational. Um, I, I think if you can back and look at, at, at you know, ramifications from drinking alcohol versus cannabis and the health benefits in regards to epilepsy and, and anxiety and pain and cancer. There's so many great benefits from cannabis and used in the right way. And the great thing today, you know, is there's 1,200 stores in Canada or 1,200 stores um, um, in Canada today. And the type of tax dollars that the Canadian government and jobs it's created you know, we're the biggest employer today in Leamington. Um, it's a $6 billion industry in Canada. It's a $60 billion industry in the U.S. today. And, you know, it's a $100 billion industry around the world. So it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And companies, you know, will um, get bigger and bigger from it. Okay, well, we're getting a lot of questions about your your roots in Cape Breton. I know, I know you touched on it a little bit and how it you know, contributed to your success. But maybe, you know, talk about how you used an, an atypical background, not having gone to you know, an Ivy League school or not having come from, you know, the typical U.S. background. How did you use the upbringing as, a, as an advantage as you kind of started your business career? So, you know, good question. You know, I went to, you know, when I tell people I went to, you know, SMU, they think I went to Southern Methodist, you know, in, in, in Texas. OK, but I make sure. Uh, um, I, I, again, um, I, I, when I would talk about, I come from Nova Scotia, a lot of people in the U S never heard of Nova Scotia. And they thought, is that where locks comes from? And a lot of cases locks, you know, Nova Scotia salmon doesn't come from there. Um, my, my, my roots being a genuine person, um, you know, if you come back and how was I a Hamish person and, you know, my poor father did teach me two things. And I always said this. My father was a great man and he treated people well. He, you know, there was times, you know, and in, in my father in his best year, you know, did not make a lot of money. But if someone didn't have milk, someone didn't have bread and they didn't have money, he gave him credit even though he knew he wasn't going to pay. So my thing is my roots taught me how to treat people, be good to people, be nice to people. My father was not a risk taker. Uh, I'm a risk taker. And I learned that very quickly, you know, how to take risks and what the risk level is. Um, at the same time, I used to see when my father with banks, um, when they'd give him a hard time, when if he was overdrawn by 35, 40 million dollars, you know, I've learned when your banks are your friends and when they're not your friends. And today, you know, I deal a lot with banks and do lots of major raises with banks and and how you deal with them and how you you know, basically keep them in check. Um, 
as I said, I was not a great student at all. Um, I was, you know, I didn't know what EBITDA was. I didn't know what EPS was, earnings for share. I thought it was something else for the first time. Um, and, and again, Eric, you know, like I said, I, I wish I had my kids upbringing from their private schools and schools. I learned along the way. But what Cape Breton taught me was integrity, be a good person, be honest, um, don't cheat or steal. And I was never afraid if I didn't know the answer, I'd ask the question. And I may look stupid, I may look dumb. Um, and, you know, but I always ask the question. So my roots and my upbringing in Cape Breton was just being that genuine, down to earth person. And that was, that was, that was what I learned there. And, you know, I have a lot of investments now in Cape Breton and I love going back there. I really do. And being part of the people there. Great. You, you touched a bit on COVID, you know, COVID and how it's impacted the business world. You're running your company from New York. You learned how to use Zoom. It, it'd be interesting from your perspective, you know, we've seen a lot of changes in how people are, you know, purchasing or consuming uh, consumer goods in COVID, you know, and, and looking forward, what do you, are some of the things you think will stay the same, like remain? And, and where will we go back to the way we did things before? So one thing is this here. Um, we're not going back to anything that was before, okay? Everything will change today one way or another. Everything will change. Um, in regards to purchasing food today, um, you know, it's no longer brick and mortar anymore. It's online or and click and pick. And it's a third, a third, a third, okay? Um, kids don't have s snow days anymore. It's going to get 10 to 12 inches of snow here tomorrow. You know, my son Lucas will still go to school. He'll go online. So everything is, 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 has to change. And that's where everybody has to adapt to that change. Um, how we buy, how we're going to travel. Um, and, and, and again, you know, I was visit with my doctor the other day. No one has the flu anymore. No one has a cold anymore. Um, because we're all wearing masks. We're all washing our hands, you know, and, and, and being safe about it and our social distancing and stuff like that. Um, so everything will change and, you know, McKenzie, BCG and all these guys, you know, are giving us advice of how to do it. And I think that's the important thing is. Um, with my other company, Whole Earth, we're working on our three-year strategic plan. Now, if I could really look and see what the world's going to be like in three years from today, I don't think I can. But I think you got to have a strategic plan. You got to have a plan out there and adapt to it as it's changing. Um, and that's going to be the important thing: is is have a plan, but how do I adapt to it? Because there's a lot of unknowns out there. And I got to tell you, there's going to be other strains. There's going to be you know, other types, you know, of COVID coming at us now. Um, the question is, everybody thinks the world's going to go back once we have the vaccine um, and start traveling around the world. There's going to be a lot of hesitation. Um, so I, I just think evolution on change on everything today, um, whether it's buying cars, whether it's buying food and, and, and come back and think about, you know, old brands like when I grew up, whether it was Coke, Pepsi, like look at the brands today. Look what's happening in regards to, you know, the cannabis world. Um, you know, in Canada, if it's a $6 billion business, it's taking consumption away, whether it's from the illicit market or taking consumption away from those that would have been drinking alcohol. So I think everybody's got to realize how I can change and adapt, how my business can change and how yourself as an individual can change we we got a question from the audience here what do you believe to be the future of medical cannabis when most of the industry seems to be chasing the recreational market so i just did an interview the other day i think medical cannabis is something that i am going to invest in big time uh, and i've done that in research and development um, we've invested um, and actually working with Israel with a company called Candoc over there. Um, we have a big medical business in Germany. Um, and we also own a business called CC Pharma that is a big distributor of medicines to drugstores. Um, 
I, I think from opioids, the replacement of opioids, I think you've seen today where sports teams are allowing it for pain. We've done a ton of research in regard in regards to epilepsy, um, cancer. So I think there's a major, major um, opportunity. And, and again, you're going to see us doing things with some of the drug companies, you know, in, in the near future in regards to that. So it's a big part of our platform, Eric, um, along with our recreation, along with our drinks, along with, you know, some of our other food products, et cetera. And I know, I know you've been asked this before many times, but, you know, based on everything you just said, do you see a lot of positive change potentially happening under the Biden administ administration when it comes to maybe going back to the coal memorandum uh, or more states, you know, legalizing de or decriminalizing cannabis use? So right now, 68% of the Americans today want cannabis legalized. One in every three Americans has cannabis legal in some way in regards to medical or recreational. Um, in regards to cannabis, um, you know, there is today, you know, 35 states where it is either legal from a medical or from a recreational standpoint. So I think, you know, the order of magnitude will be decriminalization. I think the Safe Bank Act will come into play um, from a standpoint there, which will help with commerce, um, which will help with banks, which will help in regards to a lot of the big institutions owning stock. Then I think recreational cannabis will legalize and what happens there will be state by state. But the most important thing in regards to cannabis legalizing is the Safe Bank Act and decriminalization. I think that's key. And I say that happens in the next year or two. And Eric, every state today needs money. And I think, you know, you come back and look at it is the states today are getting no money from cannabis. And listen, I walked down the street many times in New York and I smell it and they're buying it from the illicit market and states are not getting any money from it. So um, and you have to legalize because that way there, if you legalize it, the different strains and the potency and in regards to the quality and regulatory is getting that's what's getting into their hands of the users, not stuff that's being grown illicit today. And you don't know the quality that's being out there and what it's sprayed with, et cetera. That's great. Going back to some of the kind of entrepreneurial uh, questions, someone in the audience asked, who do you credit for your entrepreneurial spirit? Um, you know, listen, I, I come back, I, I, um, I, I credit a lot of people because I, you know, I think a lot of people probably bet against me. And if I was a stock, um, not a lot of people would buy my stock. And I love to be an underdog. And, uh, you know, I, I, I come back, I, you know, credit my father because, you know, he was not an entrepreneur and, and, you know, I saw what he was and, and didn't want to be like that. Um, you know, I credit my mother cause she used to yell at me, study, do your homework. And I didn't do it. Um, so, you know, I, I come back and I, I, I credit myself and I think I, I, you know, a lot of people ask me the question here, if you lived in Canada, could you have done what you've done in Canada? Um, I think, listen, being successful, being an entrepreneur is not where you live, but where the opportunities you, you are, you know, you, that's what allows you to create it. Um, and I think, again, you know, it's like anything. Um, if you don't shoot the puck, you can't score. If you don't swing at a ball, you can't hit it. And when I started, you know, Hain with my $250,000 that I had saved, I could have lost it all. But, you know, I turned it into something. And, uh, you know, I, in, in the right way, I credit myself for going out there and do it. I credit my wife for being very, very supportive along the way. It's not uh, like you got to have a job. You got to do this here. And, you know, spent time bringing up four kids while I went out there to do it. So there's a lot of credit and there's a lot of people along the way that I learned from. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because, you know, the first question asked to me, what school did you go to? Where'd you go to school? Did you graduate from Penn? Did you graduate from Harvard or Yale? Um, 
And it's not about your school. It's about the individual and having that fire in your belly. And I think at the end of the day, it's going, taking that risk and going to do it. And you know what? Failure happens sometimes. It's okay to fail. It's okay to get fired. It's okay to do those things. But what's the plan after that? Okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions here. Someone asked, you know, what, what are the lessons that you learned uh, from dealing with, with tough personalities like a Carl Icahn, uh, who I know you encountered during your time at Hain? You know, good question. Um, and Carl and I have remained friends. And I'll never forget, and I'll tell you one incident in February, you know, um, I had dinner with Carl. And, and again, there's an old saying, keep your enemies close, keep your, your, your friends closer, just decide who's your enemy and who's your friend. In February, um, I think it was 2012, I had dinner with Carl, him and his son at his house here in the city. And, you know, Carl, what I would always do is let Carl have a drink or two and uh, or three and maybe four with him, but never drink. And I finally said to him, what do you want from me? He says, I want you to sell your company. I said, I'm not selling the company. And bottom line, as, as a conversation went on, you know, he said to me, you know, I, I want you to sell your company and pounded on the table and said, I only care about money. And that's all I care about is making money. I really don't care about your people, your company, whatever. And, you know, I said, I guess this meeting's over. And I said, there's you three and me, and I'm not afraid of you. So come get me. And, you know, as I was leaving, looking for my coat, he comes running down the hall and says, give me a hug. I love your passion. Um, with that, you know, I always held my composure and spoke what I believed in, was not a yes person, and was not afraid of a challenge. And again, you know, whether it was Carl Icahn, whether it was others, you know, that had challenges, or you just got to go and be what you believe in, be yourself, and take a position. Um, sometimes it works out, sometimes it didn't. In Carl's case, you know, I befriended him and, you know, he made $450 million off, off us and uh, he was a great shareholder and, and uh, you know, also forced me to change in a lot of ways. Um, so, again, it, it goes back to what I said before, growing up in Cape Breton, you know, basically bringing people in, getting comfortable with them and not going in there and being, you know, arrogant, not being, excuse my expression, an asshole and trying to be a genuine person um, on the other hand being honest and if i said no i meant no it was not i was going to say no just for the sake of being no okay great i think one last question here that just came through is it your hope that your children will follow in your footsteps as entrepreneurs so listen that's a great question really good question um, you know, my kids, you know, and I'm big because I send my kids, you know, every day on my family chat notes. And I don't even know if my kids are on today. I let them know that I'm, you know, doing this, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, they were part of the Hain growth. No matter where we went, I took them to stores um, and, uh, you know, they're very involved, you know, you know, very much involved in my business world. And I discuss things with them. They hear me, they hear me yelling, they hear me screaming at someone, they hear me, you know, involved, they see me on the phone, they see me texting, um, etc. Um, listen, they, they, I, I feel bad for my kids, because they got some big shoes to fill. And with that, um, you know, they grew up, I say this here, as you know, with silver spoons in their mouth, going to private schools on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Um, and, and, you know, there's certain things they have to overcome. Um, one of the reasons, you know, with Hain, I decided it was time. I knew that was not for my kids. They're not going to come in into that business. Um, so they're, I, I very much, they got to go out there and find their own identity. Um, my daughter, who has graduated from you know business school at Tulane, works you know in a banking area today. 
Um, she wants nothing to do with me in regards to a business and work with her on a business or family office, et cetera. Um, so time, time will tell. Um, you know, again, these kids are going through a tough time right now virtually. Like I had a long talk to my son Trevor yesterday. He said, Dad, I don't know if I can finish this semester going to school virtually because I'm virtually learning nothing and you're paying for it. And I said, okay, let's go to work. Um, well, maybe I'll go virtually, you know, so I, I, there's, there's some good question and it's how I manage it is something that's, uh, you know, we're going to have to figure out, but, uh, I'd love to see it and they've been educated. I got them trading in the markets. I got them, you know, we've had lots of discussions about what's going on with Robin Hood and GameStop and, uh, um, you know, they know, they know what EBITDA was at, you know. 1920 i didn't know what it was at 31 35 so they they know the right lingos and uh uh they've seen a lot for kids their age so hopefully they do erwin thanks so much for answering the questions i apologize to members of the audience that weren't able to ask their questions but i'm going to pass it back now to lauren uh thank you eric we hope everyone found the program interesting and inspirational. Thank you, Erwin Simon, for providing insight from your experiences. Clearly, family is truly an important element in your life, and we thank you for sharing your story with our family. To hear firsthand from a visionary entrepreneur such as yourself is indeed a privilege for all of us. Your message of learning to turn a negative into a positive, taking risks and knowing when to walk away in addition to being open to change and adapting to situations are all lessons we can all learn from. Please accept our sincere thank you for taking the time on your weekend to enlighten us as to your journey. <clears throat> thank you, Eric Goldberg, for serving as this afternoon's moderator. Your relationship with Erwin has certainly helped to highlight his many accomplishments. And a special thank you to Dr. Joe Traeger and the Adult Programming Committee and the Adath Israel staff for putting on this afternoon's program. A recording of the presentation will be posted to the website in a couple of days. We look forward to seeing you at a future date when we host the following speakers. Tal Becker, Legal Counsel for the Abraham Accords, Israel's Peace Treaty. Brant Slomovic, a young, talented photographer who published a recent book on foreign soldiers in the IDF. He's also an emergency doctor and will be showing interesting COVID photos. And mark your calendar for this Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. when we will feature Richard Kravitz, the President Emeritus for Scholars for Peace in the Middle East, who will be speaking on the new anti-Semitism. Thank you all for joining us. We wish the very best to you and your families. Stay healthy and stay safe and have a great afternoon. <laughs>